Hello and welcome to this episode about copyright and intellectual property. Now, as course creators, entrepreneurs, experts, we are all creating content, information, processes, methodologies, systems that are unique to our brand. They are the things that make our offer unique. And so it goes without saying that many course creators come across moments of fear, concern and worry about my intellectual property. What if someone steals my stuff? What if someone copies my work? What if somebody illegally downloads, shares and resells my content? Now, of course, we cannot completely and utterly ever predict nor control what other people may or may not do, or nor can we control other people's intents and activities. However, as course creators, entrepreneurs, business owners, there are some things we can do to try and limit the impacts that might, well, might be felt if, if people do copy our work or IP. Now I've got an amazing guest here today. I'm so excited about this chat today. And uh, we have here um, Andrea Smith, who is a copyright professional, has been working in the space of copywriting, um, intellectual property and content for creatives for well over 20 years, and also is trained in intellectual property. So today we are going to go through a few tips, tricks, techniques, things that you can do to try and help keep your content protected and some ideas about what you might be able to do if you find yourself in that situation. Now disclaimer, this is information only and we recommend that you contact a legal practitioner, lawyer, attorney in the space of IP and copyright in your own industry sectors uh, if you want advice in this space. But we hope that the information we're going to share with you today gives you some food for thought, some implementable techniques and I can't wait to hear your feedback on how you found today. Andrea, welcome. Hello. Tell us a little bit about your background, where in the world you are today, and uh, I can't wait to hear some of these ideas. Hi, Sarah. Um, I am in the lovely Mount Cotton in the Redlands in Brisbane. It's quite hot today. Um, so that's my beautiful space. So it's, it's a lovely area to live in. Um, my background, um, I was actually initially a graphic artist who found myself working in the music industry um, with one of the areas of both my study and the work that I did with musicians that really stood out as a beacon to me of something that they people did not have any knowledge on was their copyright and IP. Um, so sort of early in my career, I had um, some design work pinched off me. So it was um, pinched from a client oh. um, and um, I had no idea what to do because I wasn't trained in that area. Um, so my, my graphic design training didn't give us anything to, to help us with that. Um, luckily, I was able to do my own research and resolve that situation reasonably amicably, I guess. Uh, well, I got the resolution that I wanted from it. Um, and it led me to realize that it was something that most people have a little bit of a need of a knowledge of and rarely have a need. Um, that then led me down the track of um, realizing that in these days of social media, there's so much wrong advice mm. that I have taken it on myself to try to uh, fix that. Uh, I've been teaching copyright for over 20 years, uh, mostly to creatives, uh, but to other business people as well. And have in the last couple of years and particularly taking advantage of COVID, uh, doing some study with the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, down the track, I have a book that's uh, nearly finished on copyright for small businesses. Amazing. And uh, just to let you all know, in the comments description area, there are all of the links to Andrea's work website. So you can go and check those out if you would like to get some more information from the pro. So look, I am, um, I, I first of all put together a very uh, brief blog post on, on different ways that course creators can try to protect their intellectual property. But Andrea, you know, you are the pro at this, you're trained at this. I am absolutely not an expert in this whatsoever. Um, but I would really love to hear from you, um, you know, your, your perspective on, you know, should course creators consider copywriting their work? Should they go and, and you know, look, some of these things can be fairly expensive. 
maybe you can help us with, with some of that advice today. Is it something we must do? What's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, um, it, that's, a, that's a great question. And copyright is actually free and automatic in most countries. Uh, some countries have a, another level of protection that has to be paid for. The U US is one of those. But in countries like Australia, for example, there is no um, way or means or, or requirement to pay anything. Uh, so once you have written down your course ideas, the work that you have created is automatically under copyright. And that goes for the US too, where, where a lot of people do think you do have to pay, the payment only offers you that extra level of protection. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are things that you, you have to consider. Uh, so that copyright is only available. There, there's four things that create, create a copyright, whether your work is original, um, whether it's in material form. So for something like a course that you're creating, initially that could be written down in some way. So you're, you're writing down your structures and your content even before you might make videos, for example, or uh, PowerPoint presentations that would probably be your first step. Um, it has to be um, what's called an expression of an idea. And I'll explain a little bit about that um, after this. And then there has to be a, an original author. Um, so at the moment, it means that it can't be um, AI or, or some, someone that's not a human being that makes that course. So they're the four things and they're the only things you need to be able to copyright. That's amazing. So first of all, you've debunked a massive myth. <laughs> Obviously, I heard you say the word in some countries, um, but, you know, I, to hear that here in Australia, for example, where we're both at right now, that copyright is free. I mean, that's absolutely massive, amazing and exciting. So there are those four criteria have to meet. Um, so one of the cool things that you've mentioned there is that the idea, the, the product, the course has to be in writing. So one of the things I recommend to all course creators in my course creation training is that the first thing we do is create a course outline that describes the modules, the lesson titles, the content that will be covered in those sections. So you're saying now that course plan already is not only critical for creating a great design, but it's actually part of our copyright process. I mean, that's incredible. Exactly. So there, there's something that, that that's part of copyright that's called an expression of an idea. Um, and the way that the best way to understand that is something um, it's, it's a theory that a lot of writers might be uh, reasonably familiar with called the hero's journey. Yes. Uh, the hero's journey is, is an idea, um, the expression of the idea. So if we took the hero's journey of somebody that took a journey, um, so it was somebody that came from a poor background, uh, they had to go on a long arduous journey and they came out the hero and won in the end, um, that's, an ex that's an idea. Um, an expression of that idea could be Indiana Jones or Harry Potter or the Lion King mm -hmm. uh, or something that actually has some flesh around it. Yes, and so um, like the story, the actual story structure and breakdown itself would be the expression, which is what's copyrightable. Yeah, and our course creations are um, then that expression of, of the idea. Amazing. See, those course plans are critical for so many reasons. <laughs> Make sure you yeah. follow those steps to get that course plan written down. Okay, so we get, we, we got our course plans. So another thing I recommend our course creators do, um, some people like to script their videos before they actually go in and, and deliver those training videos. Other people who are a bit more confident in front of the camera, they know their thing, they jump in front of the camera, they film their courses. I then recommend that they get those videos transcribed because there's so many other purposes that, that, re that can be repurposed for later. But so now from what you're telling us, those transcriptions then actually can go in to support the copyright of our content then. Yep. So then you've got, um, you've got that course plan, you've got your videos, which are also a material form. Um, so it doesn't just have to be, be written. Um, but I am a course creator myself. So I know that, um, and I, I write courses both for myself and for um, official training organisations. So I know that I would always have a course plan first. Then, yeah. then if I'm making a video, my video, my PowerPoint presentations, everything goes to support that that is your original work. Uh, one thing I, I would say is that I tell all my creatives and really creating a course is the same. Keep all the mistakes. So 
Uh, that might mean you might put tracking on your Word documents and keep that original version because that shows that you're working through a process. Uh, so I liken it to writing a song. If I write a song, there might be some lines that don't fit. And most songwriters would probably say, oh, well, I'll go and type that up now and I'll throw away all the working versions. Mm -hmm. For copyright purposes, you should never throw away the working versions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I'm writing a, a course, say for one of my clients, I would have um, either do version control and keep my different versions, or yeah. I would do, I often use um, Google um, Google Docs to work yeah. with clients, and then I've got all the tracking in the Google Docs, and then I just download it, and I've got all their comments and everything, and we can see the process of yeah. creating that course. That's and amazing. We, we've worked from A to, to Z um, for the final product, and, and that that's great for other reasons as well to keep those, but it's also great to prove that you've worked through a process and mm. that that's a proof that the copyright is yours. Yeah, I love it. I'm a massive fan of Google Docs myself because of you know, mostly the collaborative features, the fact you can access it on any device that you're working on, uh, but also because of that document changes tracking. So for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, um, Google Docs is like Microsoft Word, but on Google. Um, and at the very top of your document, it will say right in the middle of the screen, last update was on, and then it will say the date and time. If you click on that, then actually a whole page will appear of every single change that's ever been made in that document, the day, the time, the change that was made and who made it, which is absolutely incredible. So of course, what Andrea is saying to us here is that also forms part of our copyright. This is so great. So let's say now, um, you know, our course creator, they've got their course plan outline, they've got their, their PowerPoints and workbooks, they've transcribed their videos and have all of that in writing. All of this stuff is put together. These are all things that we can use for our copyright. What do we do with that to, to make it copyright? Is there something we have to do with it? No, it's just there. So that's something that I would then keep on file and I would keep all those changes on file as well. So I'm, I'm a big believer in version controlling as well. Uh, so I can go back and look at my past, past versions. But if I was, um, let's say I was writing my, my script for my video, I might um, just version control that or I might even be writing that by hand and crossing things out and rewriting them. Keep that paper copy as well. Amazing. So just the fact that it exists is now something that you can use, pick up and take to whomever requires to view that information should a copyright issue arise. Exactly. So amazingly yep. simple. <laughs> um, yeah, there is one myth that I don't know where it actually um, arose, but I work with lots of creatives and particularly music people seem to bring this one up a lot so maybe it did originate somewhere in the music industry somewhere way back and that's that you put the work on say a usb or a cd um, and put it into an envelope and post it to yourself and that's in the us they call that poor man's copyright and that actually doesn't work um, I, I, you know, that's what I have been advised so many times before and I pass it on because I'm like, do you know what? It's just another thing I've got. <laughs> that's brilliant. I've, I've advised that so many times. So really, there's just there's just no purpose to that whatsoever. It, it won't stand up in a in a court case. Uh, I actually went to a, a session with a, a lawyer friend where he had um, lawyers, politicians that he was trying to show um, how copyright should be taught and how important it was, um, particularly in, in tertiary courses, but in schools as well, and people from the creative sector. And he demonstrated live how he could burn something onto a CD. Um, so he had a pre-prepared envelope that he posted to himself with a blank CD in it. He got the kettle out, steamed open the envelope, put the burnt CD of someone else's work he'd stolen into the envelope, oh. got his glue stick out, resealed it really carefully, passed it around and we, none of us could tell. Oh my goodness. I noticed that the CD that he had, that he posted to himself, the original one was actually blank. Wow, that is incredible. Okay, well, there we go. That's that's debunked me too, because I always thought, you know, it's a thing. At least I've got something there. Incredible. Now, um, I do have another question, Andrew, because it, you know, in this space, 
I see three keywords that are thrown around all the time. And I think there's a lot of confusion um, about what the difference is between these three things. So there's copyright, should I, shop, should I copyright my course? Then there is intellectual property law. Then there is trademarking. So we've got these three things here. Are they the same? Are they different? What do we need to do? Can you just give us a key, sort of couple of key ideas about what they are? And when would you need each of those things? Yep, sure. So, so intellectual property law is the overarching um, law that covers trademark, copyright, but also a whole lot of other things as well. So patents, if you, you're making inventions, and it also um, all sorts of other weird things that really don't come into more the creative writing course creation side of things. Mm -hmm. So copyright sits under intellectual property law as probably the most common side of intellectual property because it's something that a lot of people own without realizing they own it yeah. uh, so every small business person will own copyright in some form or another even if they think they don't uh, I think it's a bit of again a bit of a myth that copyright is something that creative people own and they people don't realize the breadth of, of copyright and, and what it covers uh, Trademark is another part of intellectual property law, and that covers a range of things, but for mostly for course creation, it would cover uh, logos. Your, so it could cover your business name and logo. It could cover your course name and logo. So it's really all around the branding of your, your product. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have my uh, Applause Genie uh, business name trademarked, and that's trademarked under a group of uh, products and services. So trademarking has what's called classes and they're the areas or the, the uh, activities that you would do in your business. Uh, so because I do a lot of seminars, I would have the class that covers events and seminars, workshops, courses, that are, are, are mostly live in my, um, under my trademarking. I would also have products that go with that. So books that I might hand out, uh, my own textbooks that I'd create. Then I would have my online course space. So if I was a musician, I would have my live events, my sales of my music, my sales of my merchandise, because they will no doubt have merchandise. Uh, so there's ranges of classes and you pick the ones that suit the activities that you do in your business. Yep. If someone else came along and used the name Applause Genie, probably be highly unlikely um, in another country and in classes that I don't have registered under my name, I probably couldn't stop them using it. Um, that's probably the beauty of having names that are creative and mean something so with my business i work mostly with creatives i work with a lot of musicians and performing artists and people say that what i do is a little bit of magic so after actually i was a bit along the laborious process um i came up with that that name and really went from a very generic boring name that I couldn't trademark to that name that I could because it has that great history and background of, of my work history in the space it's probably not likely someone else is going to take that um, so definitely trademarking is a thing that you can do for your business and potentially your course name as well but you would have to think long and hard about how creative that name is mm. if it's fairly generic so so if I'm doing a gardening podcast and I, I just call it the gardener's podcast, I might not want to trademark that. Um, trademarking is, is reasonably expensive and it takes a long time. So at the moment, I think in Australia, it's about seven or eight months. Um, I've just done a course uh, from the intellectual property office in Korea and it was about the same there. I believe the US is roughly about the same time frame, mm -hmm. So it can take a long time for it to process and it can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that's an area where I would suggest definitely using a trademark lawyer. So even though I've been learning about trademark, I know all about it. I was able to identify some of the classes that I could trademark under and I knew how the whole process worked. And I could, I could certainly lodge the paperwork myself. I used a, a trademarking lawyer to do my trademarking. Um, the beauty of that was she understood the classes a lot better than me and came in and said, you've forgotten this, 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 and this. So there are a number of classes that I should have been working under that I wasn't. Yeah, no, this, this is just cool. such incredible information. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, now, so another question I have, you know, and I see these posts come up all the time in Facebook groups is people will go, like, I've just found that someone's copied one of my videos or one of my videos has been downloaded from YouTube and somebody else is doing something with it, right? So somebody's basically found out that someone's, you know, acquired a piece of their content and is using it somehow. And then the threads, as you know, get very out of control very quickly. There's pitchforks and knives and let's set fire to them and take them down uh, kind of comments you know a lot of people um the first thing they want to do is be like right let's sue them let's sue their behinds and take them for everything they've got right <sighs> let's chill what would you say is i mean i know every country will be slightly different in terms of the legal side but what kind of steps would you advise a course creator entrepreneur to take if they see that something of theirs is being used or copied without their permission what would you do first um firstly i would be very i would not identify anybody or anything in any thread on social media because it's just as bad if you've got it wrong as if they've stolen your work so if, if you accuse someone of stealing your work and they actually haven't uh, you can be just in just as much trouble as the if someone has actually infringed your work so um in most countries copyright law has some clauses around that so if I would suggest be very careful, don't name any names, don't name the business of the person, and probably don't take 90% of the advice that people give you on those threads. Uh, here in Australia, we're quite lucky that we have um, two organisations that are very helpful. Uh, one is the, the Copyright Council, and I'll give you the link to them to put in the, the resources, and they have lots of downloadable sheets that you can download about what to do to protect your own copyright, what you can copyright and what to do if someone's infringed. And we also have the Arts Law Centre of Australia that are a not-for-profit body that can give advice. And again, they have really good blog posts and resources on their websites. Other countries have organisations that are very similar as well. So there, there are resources out there that can assist I would first up do really do the research that you need to do to make sure that you're 100% correct and that they have stolen your work. Screenshot anything because they might take it down. So particularly if you put something on social media, even if you haven't named the person, someone might have identified them or somebody may have told you that they you've had your work infringed. And they may go back and say to the person, well, I've told them, you know, and they may take that down. Mm -hmm. So make sure you go in straight away and collect all the evidence you need to. And if you're screenshotting from your computer, make sure the date's there. So you'll capture your whole screen uh, to make sure it shows, shows dates and times. And um, because obviously if, if a date and time's in a file name, I know when I do screen captures on my Mac, it gives me the date and time, but I can go and change that. Mm. Um, that file name so I would be making sure that um, you can put times and, and places the website if you can grab it and collect all the details that you need if that's on someone else's website like YouTube or Facebook you can go and report directly to them and get them to take it down and sometimes some of those sites are very good some are a little bit slow mm. but it, they are obliged to actually take those things down. Yeah. If so we're not going to go running to the lawyer's office at this stage. So we've got, gathered all of that that data. Uh, you know, do we put our pitchforks down or get them out at this point? Would you go and contact the person? Um, what well, would you do there? If, if it's on somebody else's platform, 
So if it's on YouTube or Facebook, I would just go straight to the source, the platform and say, somebody's infringed my, my, um, my IP. Can you please take that, that down? And they are obliged to actually take that work down. So they should do it. Sometimes it can take a couple of times of contacting them. And every one of those sites has a link that you can just fill in the form or, or it has an email that you can email directly to, to say the copyright has been infringed or, or the IP has been infringed. And they do take that very seriously because they don't want to be part of a lawsuit. So that's your first step. If then you have problems, you probably need to go and seek an, an IP lawyer. And that's where one of those not-for-profit bodies can be that middle ground that can give you the right the right advice if it's on that person's own platform so if it is a stolen work that's on somebody's website for example or I've had um, somebody came to one of my seminars where some photographs she's taken she had taken were on somebody's brochure that is a little bit more difficult mm. and I would be inclined to seek legal advice first if it's very serious. So if you know that you had a client in your course and they've taken down all your course content and are repurposing it elsewhere, I would probably go straight to a lawyer. If it's one video, I'd contact them and, and say, you know, I am going to seek legal advice and you might find they might be scared enough to take it down. Um, but don't, be too a, a, accusing to say, I, I have noticed, do, are you aware that I own the intellectual property in this? I, I think unfortunately, and it's probably because of Google and the ability to search and find information so easily and quickly, people are often not aware that intellectual property exists and that they can't use those, those items. Mm. Um, and probably all of us are guilty of it at some stage yeah. and, and not even realizing. Um, then if you do have to seek legal advice because you've taken that first step of collating all the information, you'll have everything that you need to be able to give to the lawyer. Um, and then if we take a, a step back, because when you created your course, you've got all those version controls and all those working notes and everything that was from your starting point to your finished product, that's really good evidence to show that you created that piece of work. Yeah, amazing. So I really love that advice as well on the wording, because you know, you always see people get really aggressive about this and then they set, they share screenshots in social media of their like power, power message. You know, I will sue you, you've stolen my work. I will do this if you don't take it down. <laughs> and like you say, you know, that's like the first way to fast track yourself to a defamation matter <laughs> at the same time as having to seek legal advice for copyright protection. Um, um, yeah, so for example, I just had recently a friend on Facebook say um, a very well-known newspaper stole a photograph he put on Facebook. He wrote to them, um, quite coincidentally, he used to work for this newspaper some years ago, so that's uh, pretty bad. And they said, oh, we credited you. Um, crediting is only one part. You actually have to ask permission and pay if people, um, if you want to use somebody's work, there's three steps you have to credit. That's that's the law um, in, in most countries and that's called moral rights. So, so that's one part of, um, of copyright. The second part is the economic rights, which means you, you have to ask permission and pay a licensing fee if somebody asks you to pay. So he just wrote to them and said, you credited me. I, I think they spelled his name incorrectly anyway. Um, Gosh, yeah. and, you know, I will invoice you um, or I will have to take legal advice. And they, they came back and said, what do you want us to pay? Um, so they knew they'd done it and they would, you know, and I think they hedge their bets. If people don't approach them, they've got the way with it. If they do approach them, they will pay. And he, yeah. he basically said, well, this is what I would normally charge, but because of the, um, the difficulties of finding out that this had happened to me and the fact that you shouldn't have done it, I'm charging you three times as much and they just paid it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I 
good time. Yeah, very good. So um, as we come to wrapping up this, uh, this amazing, amazing, amazing session today, thank you. Um, are there any sort of final quick tips, things that people should consider doing or putting into place uh, as just part of their product creation process that might may, may help if a situation arises where they feel like their work has been changed? Yeah, I have, I tend to work with spreadsheets for a lot of what I do, because and no doubt some of your your listeners will be the same. You are also potentially using the IP of others in any courses that you're creating. So for each course, I create a bit of a spreadsheet and I will just have, uh, this, is, this is the module. Then I will have columns across and I will say, well, the video and that content is mine. I, I wrote that, I created that. The workbook and the content is mine. But I've used a photo in that workbook that I purchased off uh, Deposit Photos, say, or Shutterstock. And, you know, I have an, an annual subscription to those. So I've uh, chosen that photo. And I will always download those licenses to the photos and then put a link to in my spreadsheet to where I'm holding that license. So in, in my case, it would be a folder on my computer and also a folder um, on a cloud and I would just put both those links in to say this is this is the folder I'm holding those in so if I'm ever asked a I can show the resources that I'm using that are not mine that I've purchased from from somebody else and the resources that I'm using that that are mine and where I'm holding each of those information on file um, so for example as well I'm very lucky my husband is a musician and songwriter and he writes all my little theme tunes for any courses or any um, pro private or public mm. face, face presentations I make. But I note that as well because they're still his copyright, they're not mine. Amazing. Now I do have one question on you, know, creating our own content and making sure that we're not the ones that are breaching other people's IP, um, IP is um, a question I see very commonly come up is um, around sort of reusing and sharing YouTube videos inside educational content. You know, we are putting content up on a public platform um, and people say, course creators say, right, if I found a YouTube video, it's not mine, somebody else's YouTube video that supports whatever it is I'm teaching in my course, what are the sort of legalities around me embedding that or putting a link to that YouTube video inside my course content? Is it considered uh, reselling of IP because the course is paid or is it considered an extra resource? How do we go about that kind of situation? Yeah. Um, that's one I actually come up with a, a lot because mm. I write resources for a, um, a, a organization that delivers qualifications. So that's, you know, people will actually get a, a proper certificate out of it. And we obviously have resource guides with my resource guides. They're either printed or online and they're just simply links. So they would be, for example, if I, I was writing their copyright and IP resources, I might say, go to this website for this, go to this YouTube video for this, and I'm putting the links. Once you embed, that is a, a copyright infringement. So the way around that is to actually ask. So if you then went to that person and said, I really love your, your work can I either license, which means you may have to pay a small amount for that, or they may, may say, just credit me and you can use it, get it in writing. Again, keep that as part of your resources, but never use without asking somebody first. Um, so to, I'll give a, to give a really good example around that, um, I have a client that does, um, um, creative courses so he they're they're face to face so he works with um people that are long-term unemployed and they teach them confidence and skills by teaching them something creative and one of the things they do is this concrete pouring thing that i don't understand much about but he found a really great video on youtube that really supports what they're teaching and he wanted to show that in well, in their resources that students take home with them 
but also live in their their courses mm. he just contacted the person and the person said and it was somebody overseas i think and the person said as long as you credit me i am really happy for you to to use that mm. so in their course resource so it's little videos that people take home as as a if i want to replicate this at home i can re go on to their website and um re-look at all those videos that video they don't embed it it's a standalone extra resource and they have um un underneath that they actually have a description you know that this has been kindly um allowed by this person and here's the link to her website and her other resources amazing so it doesn't have to be hard <laughs> yeah. Andrea this has been the most insightful interview um, that I've done in a long time it's absolutely amazing and I know that this is going to really really help a huge amount of people so thank you so much for your precious time could you just let us know how people can get in touch with you if they would like to work with you or get more information from you of yeah. course the link will be below but for those listening yeah sure so my um, website is uh, applausegenie.com.au and you can find me there. And my email is magic at applausegenie.com.au. Absolutely fantastic. This has been really, really helpful. You've given me a few things to put on my to-do list today, Andrea. <laughs> um, but, you know, these things are, are important for us to consider. And hopefully none of us ever need to actually worry about uh, this particular issue. One of the things I often say to people is I would much rather have my content out there changing people's lives and helping the world than hold it back in the fear that one person might misuse it. You know, there are ways in which you can keep yourself protected, but please don't withhold that amazing information, your unique way of delivering what it is that you do. It, out there in the world, it's going to be making a difference to somebody's life. It's the only way it's going to make you an income as well. So please don't be afraid of all of this stuff. It doesn't need to be scary. Um, you know, there are wonderful people out there like Andrea who can give you advice to make sure that you are protected should you need it. But hopefully, like insurance, you never will. Cross fingers. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. The, the amount of times it happens is actually rare. So I think, and I think often when people see those threads online, they get really worried. But think about the amount of people that are out there creating content and the amount of times you actually see something happen it's it's quite rare yeah um, and I found I'll, I'll just share something really funny my my husband has a song that's been used in a lot of ads and movies and tv shows and we get lots of emails facebook messages phone calls text messages every time it's used people say they stole his song and we're like no they licensed it they paid money for it so you know often what you see in the public is not necessarily what you think you will see content being used and reused and what sits behind that is a license and somebody has actually paid to use that or reuse it um yeah so it's a legitimate reuse love it absolutely amazing tips there andrea thank you so much for your time today and i hope that uh, lots of people come and get in touch with you for more information and uh, wish you all the best thanks for being here oh, thank you sarah it was a pleasure Absolutely awesome. And if you are thinking about creating your own online course, don't forget you can grab my course creation starter kit completely free of charge. It has heaps of tutorials on there for creating your own amazing online course. Go to sarahcordner.com forward slash starter kit to get that completely for free. Look forward to seeing you in another episode. Bye for now.